conversation or something like that. I asked the organizers, you know, what did you expect for me, expect from me for, during this period? And they said, well, uh, can you do it? I said, yes, as long as you don't expect a workshop in the form of you know, going through a text and looking at the translation, etc., etc. Uh, it's not really my uh, deal, I suppose. So I'm going to more be inspired by the format that was used in the session this morning and give a little story about uh, how one might, or how it, a particular example of how somebody became someone who translates literature or has translated literature. And then after I tell that story, we can open it up for, for discussion until you run out of questions. It was interesting listening, I think it was to Shirley Birch in the first session where she, she said that she sees herself as a poet and writer. That's her primary identity. And a literary translator is a secondary identity for in, in her case. I think that's a very similar uh, kind of, I, I would also use a sort of similar way of describing my uh, my engagement with, with a literary translator. And, uh, in the earlier session also John McLean said, well, made the point that in terms of translators of Indonesian literature into, in, into English, there's, uh, there's John, there's myself, there's Harry Abling, is it possible to name any others? Uh, this, there's not many others or even any others that have done uh, a lot of published uh, translation. But I think I would classify John McGlynn and Harry Abling as people whose primary identity is as translators. What's my primary identity? Because um, that defines the framework in which why translation work has, has been done and no doubt has also affected uh, the nature and style of the translation, but most importantly the choice of translations but also the, the nature and style. I started studying Indonesian language at high school in Australia when it, was, uh, when it had just been introduced as a high school subject. Actually, it was introduced into the New South Wales senior high school curriculum as Malay before it was uh, changed to become uh, uh, a subject in the high school uh, curriculum, Indonesian. Initially, it was taught as, as Malay. And my first teacher in high school was not somebody trained properly in either Malay or Indonesian. He was actually the phys ed teacher who, have ha who happened to have spent time in Malaya as a soldier during World War II and spoke some basic Malay. So he was my first teacher in, in, uh, in Malay language in the year 11 in high school. He was transferred out of that school the following year. So I went into the final year of high school without a teacher for that subject. But fortunately, I found out that the Indonesian consulate in Sydney ran classes in Bahasa Indonesia in Indonesian on Wednesday night. So I went and attended them and sat for the exam and uh, passed and then went on to study uh, Indonesian studies, which included Indonesian language and, and literature and history at the, at the University of Sydney. But early, very early on in that Very, very early on in that journey, I you have to uh, get a feel for the timing here. This is 1969. I entered I entered University of Sydney in 1969. So that was a period during which, of course, if for those who you, I'm sure you're all aware of the, you know, the big events in world history, and that the 60s and early 70s were the period of uh, the big. Uh, political movement against the American intervention in Vietnam. 
So if you're a university student in Sydney with any brains and heart in the 1960s and 70s, you were in one way or another a part of the movement against um, the American intervention in, 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 in Vietnam. Uh, same applied to me and the, the whole atmosphere then was that not only was there this opposition to the Vietnam War but connected to it was an increased interest in the state of the third world, the problems of underdevelopment, the problems of the first world's exploitation of the third world, the fact that the poverty and misery in the third world was a, a direct result of colonialism and a direct result of the West continuing uh, neo-colonialism. So there was a radicalization effect on the student population as a whole. So if someone like myself studying Indonesian in that environment, the kind of uh, attitude that one developed, the kind of thinking that one developed was, yes, Indonesia is obviously actually like every country in the world, but Indonesia, for those who uh, happened to fall into being engaged with it, Indonesia is an extremely interesting country in the world with a long history, integrated into the Malay archipelago, many ethnic groups, long traditions, uh, fascinating history of anti-colonialism, etc., etc., etc. A huge long list of things which made it interesting. But in the atmosphere of the day, of course, you are also oriented to the problems, the political and economic and social problems of the country. The fact that it was a country with you know, massive poverty, underdevelopment, and in 1969, because that came four years after the seizure of power of General Suharto, it also had the problems related to author authoritarian rule, dictatorship, uh, military repression of the population, and uh, you studied a little bit, you also then realized that there was 20,000 political prisoners, that uh, most of the best literature and political writing of the country had been banned and suppressed, it was not, not allowed to be read. So you had that extra access to it. You had the access of um, the in how interesting it was. And then when I started to visit Indonesia, it was not only interesting, extremely interesting, but all a lot of the stereotypes about Indonesians turned out to be true at that time, Ramah, hospital, hospitable, open, friendly, etc., etc., especially if you visited Indonesia in 1969, 1970, 71, 72, I visited Indonesia in all of those years as a university student at that particular, in that particular period. Also, the number of foreigners, number of Europeans or white people who were traveling in Indonesia was very, 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 very small still. It was still a rare, uh, still rare to see uh, white people outside of Jakarta and even Jakarta not very many and even rarer to come across uh, a European or American or Australian who spoke any who spoke any Indonesian so that made the engagement also very uh, the hospitality of people and the welcoming welcoming attitude plus the general thing aspect which made the society so interesting obviously you know laid the basis for the emergence in Indonesia, even up until today, of a, of a range of people who you would call Indonesia files, people who love Indonesia and whose life is built around their engagement with Indonesia. But in the in the 60s and 70s also, there was a, a big chance that you would also be politicized by the experience. You, know, you visit Indonesia and you'd visit a country where a dictatorship, as I said, was in power where censorship and repression was endemic, uh, where everywhere you, especially in the late 60s, early 70s, everywhere you went, there was uh, you know, soldiers with machine guns patrolling and intimidating people and so on. And of course, you, was, you were in a society where poverty uh, was the prevalent condition, and still is the prevalent condition today for the vast majority of people. So. For me, um, there was always the, you know, there, as a result, there was always the, uh, 
one, one developed a, a stand of partisanship. You, you need to take a position vis-a-vis -vis the situation that one found in Indonesia. Now, in, back in Australia, I became involved in the Australia-Indonesia Association, the majority of whom uh, members were my, primarily concerned about you know, how uh, lovely Indonesian culture was, how friendly the people were, how beautiful batik was, how delicious gado gado was, etc., etc. But in that climate, I, I, as a as a member of that, I was also editor of their magazine. I tried to introduce political and, and economic development and, and and other related issues. And I would say that from that time onwards, a part of my primary identity, uh, in fact, probably you know the fun. The, fundamental basis of my, of my primary identity has been the desire to explain Indonesia to Australians and more broadly to explain Indonesia to an English-speaking world. But from that, from that background that I just explained to you, from a background of uh, not only finding the country fascinating and interesting but also feeling the need to take position on questions of dictatorship versus democracy, underdevelopment and its connection with neo-colonialism and the relationship with the West and so on. So to explain to Australians and English-speaking people as much as I could understand about Indonesia, but to pass on that understanding to others in Australian society, but from within that perspective, from the perspective of taking a position on the social and cultural reality faced by the majority of Indonesians, to take sides. And from when I first edited that magazine in 1971 or 72 onwards, uh, that's been the fundamental framework uh, for everything that I've done about, I've done in relation to Indonesia, teaching, writing, journalism, human rights advocacy, and literary translation. The first things from Indonesian literature I translated were the poems of Wes Rendra, Indonesian poet, that I'm sure you've all heard of him, who, was, you know, who wrote in the 1960s, and then he was in the United States for several years in the in the mid 1960s and uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, then back to Indonesia. When he came back uh, to Indonesia, he was uh, a poet and then a playwright. Many of whose poem, most of whose poems and plays, uh, for at least during the 1970s and 1980s, and yeah, for, for for the following three decades, all had a political, a strong political. Con Not every poem, but the vast majority of his poetry had a strong. Political content, and I started translating some of those political poems for publications, uh, bulletins, and magazines around Australia. But, and the first major trans literary translation I became involved in was uh, the translation of his play, Kisa Purjuangan Suku Naga, The Struggle of the Naga Tribe, which was published by St. Martin's Press in New York in about 1978 and at the same time by the University of Queensland Press in Australia in 1928, and which is actually going to be republished in the United States in the collection of modern Asian theatre this year. Uh, now that play was a political satire, um, very, sub very subversively critiquing the military dictatorship of President Suharto and its relations with United States and other Western uh, Western powers is highly critical to you know a military rule in, in general. It was uh, very much concerned about the plight of uh, the farmers of Indonesia in the 1970s when the play was written. Indonesia was still uh, still primarily an agrarian society. It's not anymore. But in the 1970s, it was primarily an agrarian society, so it was a play that was very much concerned about the mass of the peasantry. But uh, that was my first big experience with translating a full work from 
Indonesian language into English. And now part of the, the title of this workshop, you know, what you need to know to be a literary translator, well, I can, in terms of prepare, preparation for translating that play into English, and the play later was performed in, in Australia by one of Australia's leading theatre groups, the Nibran Theatre, performed in English later on by a theatre group in Kuala Lumpur, in the United States in two or three places. In both the United States and Australia it was produced as a radio play um, on ABC National Radio and in the United States by one of the public radio uh, networks there. The preparation for that, what do you, in terms of if you want to draw any conclusions or lessons from what you need to know in order to be a literary translator from the preparation for that. That was, as I said, a play written by Ren Rendra and performed by his own theatre group, Benkal Theatre, which was a theatre group which he led in, which was based in Jogjakarta, which he set up when he came back from the United States uh, in 1972. And during the time that he wrote that play and produced it and performed it in Jakarta, which was very difficult to perform, he had to do a lot of lobbying to get permission to perform it. Uh, during that period, I was actually a member of Bengal Theatre. So I was on site during the writing of it. I was on site during the production of it and of the performance. I lived with Bengal Theatre. Every morning I got up at, uh, before 6 a.m. and watched the 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. rehearsals of Pisa Prajuvanga and Sukhanaga and also other plays that the group performed. I participated in the evening discussions that occurred in the Brenda's house every night, five nights a week, uh, around cultural issues, political issues, economic issues, philosophical issues. And in fact, the session on politics, I uh, gave the talk each week on the session on politics. This is in 1975. Um, so I was there from the, from the time he decided to write the play during the whole process of him writing. I had many conversations with him during that period. Um, plus participating in the group, watching, as I said, watching the rehearsals. Watch, the rehearsals were held outdoors in the village where he lived. So I was also able to watch the responses of the villagers to the play and also their suggestions to him. Oh, change this word, change that word. That doesn't sound right. What about, uh, what about doing it this way or that way? The, the village population who just turned up to watch the rehearsals every, every morning. So when eventually I returned to Australia after one year in Jogjakarta and, and decided to translate Rendra's play, if, you, if one was to ask, you know, what was the preparation that was done for it? Well, the pre preparation was that whole year-long experience that I just uh, set out. Although at the beginning of that, or during most of that time, I had no plan to translate the play into English. But it's, it became clear as the manuscript, con, man, manuscript firmed up and then the play, you could actually see the rehearsals and then you saw the massive response the play performed to, to audiences. Each night the audience was about 7,000 people. It was por performed in an open air theater which, took, which had seating for four or 5,000 people but was stand, there wasn't even standing room. Uh, for most of the performances. So I could also sit in the audience. I sat in the audience every night in a different part of the audience, like in a VIP section, back section, middle section, so I could get a feel for the response of the audience to the play itself, how they responded to different lines, different criticisms, different poems that were in the play and so on. It was really, when you start to see the response of the audience and you realize also having, of course, read the manuscript, that what is what Render is saying, first of all, I agreed at that point in time anyway, I might have some differences today, but at that time when I was, when I was uh, also uh, 24 years old, 
23 years, 23 going on 24 years. So I, co I completely agree with everything he was saying. And I really, 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 really wanted the maximum number of people in Australia to hear what he said as a way of helping them understand uh, Indonesia and what was happening in Indonesia. So I think the preparation was extremely intense, even though it was an unconscious preparation to do a literary translation. Um, I never went back to him and he wasn't really, he was also similar to Pramudia in this, in this respect. He wasn't really interested in discussing the translation with any translators. I asked him, well, do you think this word, translation for this word or phrase is best? I said, up to you, la. I didn't say la, actually. Uh, <laughs> up to you, up to you, not my business. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're engaging with somebody like that for so long in political discussions, you actually start to s see patterns in how he uses words and what he means by them. Because I think that's a crucial thing with great writers or important writers or writers in whose writing many contradictions that relate directly to the reality of the society are found. That is, words have meanings. Now, words have, have, the, words have their meanings, which we all more or less understand and which you can find in dictionaries or thesauruses or words often have a special meaning through, the, through their use by a particular author. They mean something special for him or her. Not that they give it a, a sort of completely different new meaning, but in their pattern of thinking, this or that word has a particular power. And you can often find that you can often understand that directly from the manuscript, but I think it is a particularly useful preparation if you've, if you've been to, if you've been able to go through the same kind of process I did with Kisa Pradjuang and Tsuganaga. That was 1975. The next major literary translation, I actually translated two or three other plays by Rendo between 1975 and 1978, uh, but uh, I think they were less significant in the, in the overall process, but the next big project was starting to translate Bumi Manusia, This Earth of Mankind, in 1980, 1981. At that time I was working as second secretary in the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. In 1979, Pramudia, with about 20,000 other people, had just been released from prison camp. And a former student of his, because Pramudia had been a university lecturer, for his uh, arrest, he was, as you all know, he was uh, he was detained in in uh, October 1965 and kept in prison until late 1979. He was never put on trial, never charged, and when he was released, he was given a letter saying that uh, there was no evidence of him having ever done any wrongdoing, but he would still need to report to the military and police every week he had to do for another decade, more than another decade. He was released in 1979. I arrived to take up my position in the Australian Embassy in 1980 and one of his students from the time he was a lecturer before his arrest uh, introduced, took me, took, took me to him, uh, took me to meet him in his house and uh, we started a conversation which went on for uh, a few decades until he, until he passed away years ago and was soon after that I started meeting and uh, having discussions with Prabhupada yeah, that uh, I was introduced to two of his uh, co-workers who, had, who were both also former political prisoners, who had one who had been released also in 1979, one who had been released a couple of years earlier, both were, one was a publisher, had been a publisher before his arrest in 1965. One had been a journalist before his arrest in 1965, and they collaborated to set up a small publishing company to publish Pramudia's works, the works that Pramudia had written while he was in prison camp on Buru Island. Um, this was a very daring act, in fact, 
uh, an amazingly daring act. Of the 20,000 political prisoners who'd been released from prison in 1979, only these three men, out of 20,000, only these three men dared to take a public, to carry out a public activity in defiance of the military government of Suharto because they were banned from any activity in the publishing realm. All former political prisoners were banned from working in any sector of the economy declared as vital, and that included publishing. So the decision to set up a publishing company and publish the books was an act of defiance. I was introduced to uh, Yusuf Isak and Hashim Rahman, the two other gentlemen, and also shown the manuscript of Bumi Rusia, which I read basically in one reading. Uh, and I had the same attitude, in fact, the same but much, much stronger attitude towards this than uh, as I did towards Kisa Bajulang and Tsukanaga, that is, people had to read it. And because I also knew that the, the book in Indonesian was about to be published and may get banned and may cause uh, problems for Pramudia and, and Yusuf Isaac and Hashim Rahman, I also thought it needed to be read in English as soon as possible. Uh, no point in spending two or three years on this. This needed to get out as soon as possible. They, did, they were already in the process of seeking translators, uh, the publishing company, uh, Pramudia and his two friends. Uh, some responses that we sit back were, yes, but I can do it in two years' time, or I can do it in three years' time. I went to the, their house and said, I know I've read it, this is a great novel. I've already started translating it. I've already started analyzing the vocabulary. I had a big, I'd already done a big vocabulary list. Uh, I said, I want to, you know, I want to translate it and uh, I, I would try and get it done for them as quickly as possible. I did a sample translation, uh, which they looked at. Also circulated a bit. Some people didn't like it. Some people liked it, as you as you might expect. But in the end, I decided to go ahead. I completed the translation uh, while I was working in the Australian Embassy, and then uh, offered it to various publishers. The publisher who uh, most quickly agreed, and therefore the publisher that ended up publishing was Penguin Australia, in collaboration with Penguin UK. Uh, and so. I think in about, I forget the year now, uh, I finished it in 1981, so 1983 or 1984, uh, it, it, it was published. And then I, I translated the three following novels, uh, Anat Samoa Bangsa, Tijak Lanka, Dan Ramakatsa, in, in the following several years. But in many respects, the process of for, for preparing to translate was similar to that of my experience with Rendra's The Struggle of the Naga Tribe. I spent many hours in discussions with Pramudia, not about the translations, because his attitude was the same. Translation is a separate thing. That's your business. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. That's a separate creative exercise. Up to you. You can do it however you want. Uh, but I had many discussions him about, about politics and about history, about the ideas that were behind the novel. Uh, the f what the ideas which inspired him to write it, the ideas that inspired him back at the, in the late 1950s to research it, uh, discussions with him about the historical characters, that in, the historical figures that inspired the characters in the novel, because nearly all of the characters in those four novels are based on actual existing historical figures, including the main figure, Minka, and also the main, main the narrator in the fourth volume, Pangamanan. They're all based on actually existing historical figures. So I had many, many discussions with him. And, I sh and it was a similar experience as with as with Rendra. I completely agreed. And and today, even today, I still absolutely completely agree with his understanding of the historical processes he was writing about.
he was writing about how Indonesia came into being. What were the origins of Indonesia? Which, to his mind, the Indonesian population during the 50s, 60s, and especially during the military rule of General Suharto, had been completely miseducated. He, his view was that the Indonesian population had been completely miseducated, totally miseducated about the history of the origins of Indonesia itself. They were brought up on Dutch textbooks, textbooks written by Dutch historians, and then, and then built upon by American and Australian historians, who he thought gave a totally fallacious, totally wrong, totally fallacious view of how Indonesia came about. And there are many, many layers to this, and, we, and that was what we, did, what we discussed quite a lot. Not only with him, but also with his two colleagues, Isha Isaac and Hashem Rahman, Hashem Rahman. And as they published the books, then of course there was a political issue about whether they would be banned or not, how to fight that, how to defend the books, how to defend the books against the right-wing intellectuals who started attacking it, how to defend the books against the regime, how to best get the books into the English-speaking world. So it became a political project, not just a formal linguistic project. It was a political project. And that required another round of dialogue and discussion with them. Um, and I think, again, it was, as I said, similar to the Kisa Prajuvanga and Sukunaga process, that the preparation for this literary translation was based upon a, a fairly lengthy period of intense dialogue with Pramudia and his colleagues about the purpose and the politics and the meaning of the messages he was trying to convey. And also, from my part, an agreement, a passionate agreement actually with what he was trying to say. So my motivation in translating both Render and Pramudya was not simply that I thought the ideas were important for people to hear, but I completely agreed with them. Somebody asked me the other day, do translate, do you, translating, do you have to suppress your own, uh, you know, your own perspectives? Well, it depends. If you, have, if you believe you have the same perspective, and if you've had you know, a year of discussions with somebody, so that you you know you're on the same wavelength, more or less, in the, in, but with different angles, of course. Uh, then in, in my case, I've, I've never felt in translating Pramudya or, or Rendra that there's any question of, of, of suppression, suppressing my own perspective. It's basically about how to get their message across, as I understand it from the manuscripts, but enriched by the dialogue with them, not about the manuscripts, not about the manuscripts themselves. The dialogue I had with Prudia and uh, his publishers and his editor was never, never about the manuscript itself, linguistically, but about their worldview, about how they understand it, understood different, different issues. So that's been uh, the, the story uh, up to now. I haven't, uh, the, as I said yesterday, they, the late, the last translations I did were in, uh, two, I published were in, I think, 2009, 2010, both Singaporean publishers, the uh, Arak Dedes, which published in English as Arak of Java by Horizon Publication, by five Horizon Publishers in Singapore, and then Hokkiao in the, the Chinese in Indonesia, which is a non-fiction, uh, a non-fiction work by Pramudia, journalistic work really by Pramudia, uh, published by Satek Books. Uh, then, then Fun said it's going to be re uh, reprinted um, probably, probably this year. I don't have at the moment.